Hey guys, welcome back to the podcast. You know, an overwhelming majority of Americans feel defeated and alone. Perhaps you're not alone in those emotions. We've struggled in our current times of crisis and uncertainty that we're coming out of, but we're still lingering in some of these emotions. And my guest today puts language to it. He calls it soul fatigue. He's an author, a speaker, a pastor, and a theologian. Dominic Doan offers us a much needed vision of hope in his new book that I absolutely loved, Your Longing Has a Name. He shows us who God is and who he says we already are. We are created, we are loved, and we are called by him to live, live out his dreams for our lives. So Dominic is here today to help us know what we can do when our souls feel weary, what is our shadow side, and how do we manage it? And how can we stay rooted even in life's disruption? So I want you to lean in for this insightful conversation on how our souls were made to flourish. Welcome, mm. Dominic. I'm so honored to have you here on the Make Life Matter podcast. Thank you. It's an honor to be here with you. Well, I shared earlier, we have a couple of things in common. We both pastored in Maui and lived out there mm -hmm. for a while. And uh, we both have kind of navigated this season that all of us have come through, this season of COVID and uncertainty and mm -hmm. all the all the things that came with it, but I think that your book is such a timely resource for us. It really leans into what I think so many of us have wrestled with. I want my husband to read it. It's one of the best books, Dominic, that I have read in a long time, and I read a lot of books, so I could not I cannot encourage our listeners enough to pick up a copy. In fact, when this airs, it's just about to be released, guys. It releases April 26. So Dominic, you're the founder of Pursuing Faith and the author mm -hmm. of When Faith Fails. You and I both have a heart for those that are struggling and wrestle with doubt. Mm -hmm. You hold a master's mm -hmm. degree in theology from the University of Oxford. Oxford, you've served as a pastor in multiple states. But like so many of us, as you were navigating this book and navigating your own kind of crisis and, and soul fatigue, I like the fact that you don't shy away from that. You lean into that in the book. And so it's so needed right now. I love that you wrote this. Maybe our souls are tired. Your soul yeah. is everything. If your soul is flourishing, nothing you go through can destroy you. But if your soul is crumbling, nothing you go through can heal you. The health of your mm. soul shapes the outcome of your life and a disordered soul is perpetually weary. Okay, a lot to unpack already right there. And you can see guys, the sense of the way he writes, it's very thought provoking and insightful. So talk about what was even your heart behind this, Dominic, and why yeah. you knew this was the book you needed to write right now. I think it's because so many people are struggling right now. Yeah. Um, you, you look at the stats over the last couple of years, and it's it's absolutely heartbreaking. I mean, we're struggling, whether it's physically, emotionally, spiritually, mentally. You mentioned doubt and deconstruction, this tsunami of people who are leaving the church, leaving faith, uh, deconstructing their faith. Um, you know, I was just reading 72% of people, and this is, you know, speaking for, for here in America, are overwhelmed by stress, 72% feel exhausted. Uh, this one was really sad that 67% feel lonely and about half of us say that we're hopeless. Um, so something's happening right now, uh, really across the world where there's a sickness, there's an exhaustion, there's a fatigue. And I pull back some of the layers in the book to say, okay, let, let's talk about this because you know, a disordered soul um, is perpetually weary, mm. right? And in so many conversations I'm having with friends lately, in fact, I just got out of a lunch uh, a couple hours ago and, you know, I asked, hey, how are you doing? And in a single word, I'm just hearing this over and over, I'm exhausted mm. <laughs> or I'm tired. And that can manifest itself in so many different ways, negative thinking, restlessness, abrupt changes in emotion, uh, anxiety, disconnection, indifference, lack of aspiration, burnout. We hear a lot about burnout. Sure. That no amount of sleep or time off can fix, right? So what is it? What is it we're needing? What is it that our soul is longing for? And in, in this book, that's why I call it Your Longing as a Name. We have to engage with what our soul is actually desiring and craving and, and screaming out for. And what it desires ultimately is the, the healing that comes from a robust, deep, beautiful relationship with God. Mm. 
Yeah. And if we don't recognize that this isn't, I need a good night's sleep. This is a much deeper soul weariness, the fatigue that comes Mm -hmm. in. Like for my husband, for example, decision fatigue through all of this in Mm -hmm. pandemic, compassion fatigue, you know, we're, we, we're just Hmm. reeling from our own pandemic. We've got Ukraine, we've got this, we, we just can't be Afghanistan. It's just hard to kind of stay ahead of that sense. Plus your own personal crisis you might be managing and navigating yeah. uh, relationships that got strained. So there's a lot that can contribute yeah. to this disillusionment, you know, with the church yes. or with God or with faith. So, you know, you're, you start out kind of saying, we have to be aware of it, even as you, I don't want to yeah. jump ahead into knowledge, but we have to be aware of what we're facing and mm-hmm. feeling before we even know how to move past that. So what would you recommend if someone's listening already and they're saying, wait a minute, I think this is me. I think, yeah. I think my soul is weary. Like, what would you say is the first thing to do when we feel mm. our souls becoming weary and burdened by soul fatigue? Oh, that's, I mean, that's such a good question. I think it, it's becoming self-aware mm. of our own limitations. Um, and then also engaging with the deeper longings of our soul, mm-hmm. because at a superficial level, we may think, well, what I need right now with inflation is a raise, or what I need right now in a relationship is a better one or a bigger house or whatever, a more fulfilling job. But the deeper longing behind that is, well, the New York Times, they, they had this fascinating article uh, it came out a few months ago, and they were defining the ethos of our age and, and talking about what we're facing right now collectively. And the word they used was intriguing. They, uh, they used the word languish. Mm. They said that the, really the state, the emotional, spiritual state of people today is we're, we're languishing. And that word languishing is a, it's a beautiful ancient word, actually. Um, it goes back to a French expression uh, that means to be faint. Um, but you, you can go back even further to the Latin uh, it's the word languere, uh, which is related to being lovesick. And he, here's the thing that hit me. It's like, okay, we're languishing. We're, we're longing for something. But what is it that we're longing for? You know, Shakespeare, he, ha- he has one of those lines, a in, 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 beautiful line in his book. He said, those lips that love's own hand did make to me that languished for her sake. And the point he's making there is that languish isn't so much the absence of emotion, but it's the presence of longing. Yeah. Uh, languish is the ache of lovers. It's the sigh of weary travelers who yearn for home. And I think one of the great needs really and it, it is a new apologetic for this age of languish. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that means understanding the deep, true, yearnings of the soul because when you sift through the debris that's swirling in our lives right now um past the grief you know most of us know people who died during the pandemic yes the tears the disappointment boredom frustration the confusion and apprehension of tomorrow what's happening as you mentioned ukraine and the threats of that spring globally what's lingering beneath all that debris is a soul that is fiercely lovesick for God, Mm. a soul that is burning with desire for his healing, his shalom, his redemptive nearness. And and so I think it's recognizing, okay, some of the symptoms in our life that our soul weariness is causing, but then taking it a step further and saying, okay, what is it that I'm really wanting? What is it that I'm really searching for? And, you know, St. Augustine, the fourth century theologian, he said, my weight is my love. Wherever I am carried, my love is carrying me. So even as gravity pulls us towards itself, the soul is being pulled towards its source Mm. in in God. And if the object of our love is in him, we'll discover that our infinite longing can only be satisfied by an infinite God. Mm, That's so good. It's so profoundly stated. I mean, and the whole book is like that, guys. It's, it's just something you just have to sit with. And, and there is this kind of soul check that comes on early on in your book. Like yeah. you don't let us get very far into the book without realizing, okay, wait a minute. I need to sit with why does my soul feel the way it does? Where mm-hmm. is the awareness of what I need to shift to? So you mm-hmm. mentioned a couple of things that I want to kind of pause on for a second. You've talked about flourishing. Our souls are created mm-hmm. to flourish, not to languish. 
So we're going to long for something. We're going to worship something. So the idea is being aware of what it is that we're longing for moving toward God as being the sole provider of what our hearts long for. You say this Dominic in the book, flourishing is participation in the life Mm. of God. So if we understand what it means to be longing and and souls that are weary, what does it look Mm. like to you for a soul to flourish? Oh my goodness. Mm-hmm. Um, there's so much in that question. And again, to you know, reiterate, w- when I wrote this book, uh, it was coming out of a place in our own life of fatigue. Yeah. You know, and I talk about that in the, in the first chapter, especially um, death of family members and uh, just a number of crises back to back to back. And, and that led me to this study of, wait a minute, <laughs> um, it's not just the circumstances that are causing fatigue. There, there's something deeper at a soul level. And I came across this verse in Third John where it says, "Beloved, I pray that you would you would flourish even as your soul flourishes." And so I began to look in Scripture and realize, like, wait a minute, God's desire for our life is that we would flourish at the deepest level. But what is flourish? Because you know, it's a it's a popular word. I'd say the last year you're hearing more and more of it. It's kind of entering popular discourse, and you're seeing com- large companies start to wield that term, but the way we use it culturally is, I don't know, as a synonym for the abundance, the abundant life or happiness or the euphoria you get if you're in a state of flow, or, or you could go back further to a field of research called positive psychology. And they were some of the first to talk about flourishing in the West. And, but they said it flourishing hinges on five attributes, favorable emotions, favorable engagement, favorable relationships, meaning, accomplishments. Um, So it's all very success-oriented, comfort-oriented. So when we hear the word flourish, culturally, that's what we tend to think it is. Mm. But when you look in scripture, what you find is that it's rarely referring to accomplishments, possessions, or sappy optimism. I think I can, I think I can. what the Bible is talking about is an inner virtue mm. that grows despite how successful mm. or difficult life may be. Yeah. Um, and I began to see this all of a sudden on almost every page of the Bible, this beautiful vision of God creating male and female from the very beginning to flourish. In fact, I mentioned this in one of the chapters that in Genesis It says that God breathed into Adam and Eve, right? And they became a living soul. The first use of the word soul is connected to the breath. Mm. Uh, In Hebrew, it's this word ruach, right? It means wind or spirit. The breath of God comes into them. They become alive. And you know that word alive means it's flourishing. Uh, Mm. It's actually connected to this beautiful Hebrew phrase. Uh, It's a word picture, actually, of a flower that's blossoming in beauty. Mm -hmm. So God's vision for humanity is that our souls would flourish and thrive. He placed them in Eden, which means delight, to care for the garden, to create flourishing in the world. And then, of course, you have Genesis 3, and (laughs) everything went south after that. But God's vision for us didn't change, right? Right. This is why you have in Psalm 1, you know, God uses the the picture of a tree. It's why I have a tree on the, the cover of the book is that we're to be a tree that's rooted in him, flourishing in him. It's why Jesus in his vision statement was, come to me when you're weary and Mm. I will heal you. I'm going to restore you. Like David said in Psalm 23, or if you believe in me, out of your innermost being will gush forth rivers Mm. of living water. You go to Revelation. It's it's like a mini Bible study. (laughs) You go to Revelation. And it's how the Bible ends, right? You have the tree of life and you have the river and no more tears and no more heartache, no more pain, no more pandemics, no more injustice. Like yeah. those things are gone. So God's vision from Genesis to Revelation is that our souls would flourish. But unlike contemporary versions of UBU mantras uh, and definitions of flourishing, where it's all about physical abundance, God's definition is that our soul would thrive in spite of, in the face of hard times. In fact, it's often the hard times that can help our soul come alive in ways that it wouldn't have before. So true, so insightful. And you talk about, peppered kind of throughout the book, is the way sin 
takes a takes a pretty big bite mm. out of the intention that God had for our souls to flourish. Mm -hmm. I like the statement that you say here, your soul breathes the secondhand smoke of your vices. I thought that was mm -hmm. a very powerful way to say that. The reason God is against sin is because he is for you. So, mm -hmm. you know, when we think about sin entering the garden in chapter three, from then on, now the original intent of our soul flourishing is tainted and marred by sin. Mm -hmm. We're not going to get away from it, but how do we become aware of it? You know, repent of it. You, you've got so much in here. So I want to talk about there, you know, when you talk about um, these seven gifts and virtues, you also talk about kind of these seven vices that come in yeah. and that are the corruption yeah. of it and the deadly sins when we talk about a shadow side. So let's jump to that yes. for a second, and then we'll come back and talk about these seven gifts. So you have a whole mm -hmm. chapter called the shadow side. It's this insightful mm -hmm. reflection on sin and this corruption that our shadow side um, kind of corrupts. And mm -hmm. if you look at the seven deadly sins are really a corruption of the seven um, virtues that you kind of frame the whole book around. So in that part, Dominic, you describe sin as misplaced desire. So mm. tell us what you consider a shadow side to be. And then I want to talk about those virtues, but because we're kind of already discussing here, like we're created to flourish. Why yeah. don't we flourish? Well, some of it is because of sin and our propensity right. for it. So how do you frame that out as a shadow side? What is that? How can we manage what you would call our misplaced desires? Oh, wow. Okay. So really good question. Um, to back up one step. So when I'm looking at this idea of flourishing, my, my next question is how? Mm. <laughs> Practically, what does yeah, that look yeah, yeah. like? How do we flourish? Is, yeah. Is there a place in scripture that would give us a roadmap? Mm. And that, that led me to the, the seven beautiful gifts God offers us in Second Peter 1, which is one of the, it's a, it's a more obscure part of the Bible that you don't hear many sermons on. Mm. Uh, we, we don't reference it that much, but I think it's really the, and I, I share why in the book, but I I think it is the roadmap towards a flourishing life. And there's a language of flourishing embedded in that chapter. It comes out of the story of a man who had burnout, Peter, and then his soul burst into life again. Um, and he mentions those seven virtues there. He says, add to your faith goodness and knowledge and self-control and perseverance, godliness, mutual affection and love. And one of the ones you're highlighting here is when he talks about self-control yeah. in, in the chapter, I, I talk about, you know, it's confronting our shadow side um, because the typical approach you'll hear, whether in broader cultural narrative or even in some church settings, to be honest, is the way to deal with your shadow side. The way to practice self-control is through repression, right? right so you got to right. repress whatever sin you have. And usually that looks like admonitions to throw away, burn, flush, ax, destroy, or whatever, yeah, yeah. whatever thing is causing you to stumble. And, you know, we've all probably seen those sermons where a pastor dramatically gets on stage and, you know, he, he gives a talk about the evils of the internet or TV and then smashes it or something. I, I've seen one like that. It's like, yeah, wow, that's, yeah. you know, and that approach, well, it's a lot like Homer's epic poem, you know, the Odyssey, where Ulysses, he's trying to resist the bewitching song of the sirens, mm. right? And, and the way he does it is, okay, tie me to the mast, and you're going to plug my ears, and we're just going to sail by, and if you hold me back, then, then I'll be able to deal with this temptation. Mm. And it really didn't work, right? He starts to strain into the ropes that are holding him and it was, it was a horrific story um what you see in scripture though is different because there's a difference between trying to manage our shadow side or repress our managed side or shadow side and being redeemed mm. and what i see in scripture is less language of repression and more language of redemption mm, I love so that. Towards the end of that chapter, this and this was so uh, eye-opening to me to, to do this research because, mm -hmm. you know, the rabbis in the ancient world, they argued that there are two impulses in every human heart. Uh, they called them the yetza, Yetzer Hara, which is the bad side, and the Yetzer Hatov, which is the good side. Mm -hmm. And they said that these two things are at war within us. You know, the Apostle Paul uses that same language in the book right. of Romans. But what's interesting is the rabbis believe that the Yetzer Hara, 
was this energy or force that could actually be redeemed for the good in our life. Mm. So for example, the impulse towards self-interest, once redeemed, can be used for creative causes like building a house or starting a business or the impulse toward greed. It's an evil desire. But if that's redeemed, that could turn into wise financial decisions or investments or saving money or the impulse towards passion can lead you to falling in love and selflessly nurturing a family and remaining tirelessly committed to your spouse. And, and so I began to ponder this like, oh, so the shadow side that we have in us, the way to deal with that, the way to practice self-control is less, I've got to repress it because we all know that sin's greatest strength is secrecy. The more we push it down, it just becomes latent in us, right? Yes. It gets more toxic. So it needs to be brought out into the light, right? Yes. The Bible uses the word repentance. Yeah. And then it's redeemed at the foot of the cross. Okay, Lord, there's these parts in me, the parts of my story or things I've wrestled with. What would it look like for that to be redeemed, to bring beauty into the world? Mm -hmm. And this is, the, this is the heart of the gospel, right? God using broken, messed up people flowing through our brokenness to reach a world to bring healing. Uh, one author he put it this way. He said, we are wo all wounded healers. Yeah. Like, I think of Thomas. Thomas, one of my favorite characters in the Bible. Yeah. And Jesus invited Thomas. He said, touch my wounds. Yeah. And it was through the touching of the wounds that there was redemption, that faith came to be. Right. And we're all wounded healers. And mm -hmm. redeeming our shadow side means we need to be open, and authentic with those wounds, with the sins, the, the stuff that we all wrestle with. And then God using that place of brokenness to shine his spirit and his beauty and his, rede his redemption. Look what grace can do. Look how a story can be redeemed. Mm, I love it. And I love the fact that you don't shy away from sin and how it does keep our soul from flourishing. But instead of this yeah. language of we've got to manage it or we've got to repress mm -hmm. it, you really put a very different frame on we it's redeemed it's re, it's redeemed mm -hmm. through the blood of the lamb and then mm -hmm. the fact that those areas that could have been our most painful our yeah. our biggest areas of struggle you know are yeah. the very areas i mean i think of peter you know it's second chapter uh, second peter chapter 1 mm -hmm. that you were referring to it a second ago i'll read that at the end of our episode and you know, his own life is such a powerful testimony of, it's not like he just became a different person. I mean, he was still outspoken right. and he was still, <laughs> yeah. you know, kind of wild on the wild side, Peter, but it was those very character traits that redeemed. Yes. I love so that. Instrumental, but left yeah. on his own, those character traits were self-destructive. Huh. And so yeah. I just, I just think, Oh, that's so beautiful. I, yeah. Even hearing you share that, um, my mind just went to the story of when he denied Jesus, right? Yeah. And, yeah. and I, I talk about this in, in the opening chapters, his trajectory towards burnout, his trajectory towards discouragement, honestly, yeah. a, a place of suicide even. Yes. Um, and it all culminated at a fire. Mm -hmm. He's standing at a fire. He denies he knew Jesus, weeps bitterly, the rooster crows, all of that. Mm. And then Jesus tracked him down yeah. and he stands at the shore of the lake where Peter had gone back to his former life, you know, yeah. the former things. Jesus calls out to him and says, friend, <laughs> have you caught anything? Which I love that Jesus called him friend, because if it, if it were me and my best friend had just betrayed me, I'd be like, hey, loser, you yeah, know, ex-disciple. Exactly. Um, but Jesus called him friend and Peter realized it was the Lord. Mm. He jumped into the water says he put his coat on first, then jumped into the water, which is yeah. interesting. It tells me that he's, he's like, I'm done with this life. I'm never going back. Mm. Besides, I like my coat. I'll take it with me. So yeah. he jumps in the water. And when he gets to the shore, what does he find? A fire with coals. Yeah. The exact same thing, the exact same place in a way mm. where he had denied Jesus. What, what is Jesus doing? Jesus is bringing him back to the place of his deepest, darkest failure. And he's redeeming it. That's it. And he stands there with Peter and says, now feed my sheep. Right. Follow me, Peter. Right. That's so beautiful. It is beautiful. Just even in that story, even the fact, you know, Peter denies him three times and then Jesus challenges him three times. Do you love me? Yeah. So it's really just 
a rest, such That's a right. restoration. It wasn't just a restoration yeah. of the call of God on Peter's life, but it was a rest restoration of relationship. And that's how we can trust mm -hmm. God to know if something comes into the light, he exposes us to yeah. heal, not to shame mm -hmm. us. In my mm -hmm. um, second book, Fearless, one of the women that I, I studied and wrote about was the woman with the issue of blood. And so mm -hmm. here she is crawling on her hands and knees, you know, in the gravel, knowing that Jesus could heal her, but so ashamed and so culturally uh, mm -hmm. shunned, you know, for being mm -hmm. unclean, not able to be there not wanting people to see her. And so he turns around and calls her forward in that moment. And so I had to research that and process that. Why did he need to do that? Couldn't he have just healed her? Couldn't he have been done with it and kept going and she was healed? Did we have to make it a public moment? But there's so much to unpack even in that story. And the fact that it was, he, did, her issues did not make him unclean. He made her whole. Yeah. And if that wow. wasn't done publicly, then she's still living, living with the shame and the stigma of being the woman who bled for 12 years. Mm -hmm. And so being able to, to redeem that moment. So I wrote in that God does not bring things into the light to shame us. He doesn't expose right. something to shame us. You mentioned David in the book, yeah. he had to deal with it so that because we, God knows that our soul will not flourish in the way that we were made to flourish. If yeah. sin is, if sin is marring it now, we're, none of us are perfect. We're not talking about perfection, but we're right. talking about living in a state that allows God full access mm -hmm. to every part right. of our life. So that if it is brought into the light, it's for the purpose of redemption, yes. restoration, yeah. reconciliation, not for the purpose of mm -hmm shaming us and harming us and so mm -hmm. it's only the enemy of our souls that wants us to stay in the shadows and stay yeah. in the um in the trap of sin because he knows mm -hmm. our soul will not fully flourish so i loved the way you framed even mm -hmm. sin and the what keeps our soul from flourishing in a way that still woos us to a god that loves yeah. us that created yeah. us to flourish and to know that if something is brought into the light, it is for our good, it is for his yeah. glory, and that we can trust him in the process of that. So we, yeah. we have desires, we're created for desires. You talk about the longing and the languishing, but it's the misplaced desires and yes. searching for the wrong things that then have to be redeemed in the light yeah. of, of his goodness. So any thought on that? And then I'm gonna ask you one more question. Oh. <laughs> I know this book yeah, is well, so, I just, I'm I telling love you, I could sit in one chapter of your book and it oh. would take more than 30 minutes to discuss guys. This is one of the most thoughtful books I've read in so long. So I feel like I'm doing a, like a disservice almost to the book because we're having to drive by, you know, like in the McDonald's fast food version of it, but it's, <laughs> it is a five course, like steak dinner that you want to sit and not leave the restaurant for a while. It's that kind of a book that your oh. soul needs to sit with. So mm -hmm. I cannot encourage you enough to read it. And I know we're only giving you scratching the surface, but any thoughts on that, Dominic, something that might've been yeah. kind of pinging as I was sharing that. Yeah, absolutely. I think framing it around who God is and mm. why he wants us to flourish and what sin is in that context, because we often look at sin as it's what God says we can't do. And God yeah. just wants to reign on our parade and make our life miserable. That's how culture would define it, right? Yeah. Even the word sin, it's funny how many Christians don't want to use that term. I know. But what what is what is sin? Well, it, it's it's essentially anti-flourishing, right? <laughs> it's uh it, it, it's soul death. Um mm. and the reason God calls us to pursue him and know him and love him and engage with our longings is because he desires for our soul to bloom like the flower, like, like Adam and Eve when they were first created. You know, the, the, the Danish philosopher Kierkegaard, he said, sin grows every instant one does not get out of it. Yeah. And it's so true. Like, it's not until it's brought into the light that, that healing can be found. And that's the heart behind this book. I so appreciate your kind words about it because I, I wept over this book, prayed through this book. Mm. A, you know, a lot of our own journey is, is woven into this book. You know, Hemingway, he, he said that uh, writing is easy. You just sit at a typewriter and bleed. And, <laughs> you know, this is a writer. It's, it's hard. You it's hard. sit at your computer and, and you wrestle over it. But I really hope and pray that all the wrestling and weeping and bleeding all over it would 
that God would use it to bring healing because it's what we're needing right now. Yeah. Our, our souls are languishing, but there is a way to thrive. Yeah. There is a roadmap God gives us in his word to flourish again. Absolutely. And that's the thing. We can flourish again. We don't have to stay in this state. You don't have to stay perpetually weary. Don't let the enemy make you think that, or even believe that lie yourself. Know that, you know, if you're feeling that today and you just haven't really known what the next step is, this Mm -hmm. is the book I'm telling you need to read next. I want to ask you one last question, Dominic, even though there's a million I could ask, but you know, we're not going to get away from intrusions and disruptions. Life is still going to have them. We've come through a huge one. But for yeah. people who are saying, okay, so if I come through the last two years, I get a better mindset, what encouragement would, yeah. you, would you have for us to continue to stay rooted like this tree, mm. like Psalm 1, mm-hmm. grounded in who God says that we are, despite the disruptions that life is going to bring? Mm. Well, okay, wow. Um, I would take this probably to the, the first gift that, that God gives us in his word Mm. as a way for our soul to flourish and it's what peter calls goodness and i go into you know the the, what that meant in the original language but the way that the writers of the bible understood that term is the source of goodness is god himself right psalm 73 god is good and that's that's what prayer is so Mm. if if adam and eve first flourished bloomed like the flower when god breathed into them that's essentially what prayer is for us. It's what keeps us rooted. It's, it's breathing. It's waking up in the morning and breathing in grace and the presence of God. You, you read a verse and you ask the Lord how to live it out. You drive to work and you share with him what's on your heart. You, you walk out of a difficult meeting and you just release to him the pain mm. you carry. Even the small, subtle moments, uh, prayer is, I think, most rich and sincere, laughing as you wrestle with your kids or stand transfixed by a sunset or walking hand in hand with your spouse or relishing a good cup of coffee or a meal, right? Prayer, prayer is the whisper. Thank you. Mm. And, and that thank you, that gratitude roots us, it, it grounds us. And it's interesting to me how prayer, it not only makes you aware of how good God is and how beautiful he is and understanding his heart and his word, but it also helps us reframe some of our issues too not that the issues don't matter but like Moses when you're on the mountain somehow the magnitude of our problems seems to shrink and I think this is the biggest way that our souls can begin to come alive again you know David in Psalm 23 when he talked about the Lord being our shepherd right I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me to the still waters. And then there's this beautiful line that says, he restores my soul. Mm. And the cool thing is that word restore literally means in the original language, he will return my breath to me. Mm. Mm. It's when we're with him in the green pastures, sitting in his presence by the still waters, opening up scripture and spending time with him that he begins to breathe into us just like he breathed into Adam and Eve Mm. and our soul once again can burst into life prayer is the ultimate way I believe that we can stay rooted in a rootless age Mm, that's so good that's so good I loved that phrase that how you define restores I I interviewed Daniel Kuhnman a few months ago he wrote breath of life Mm. it's been developed into a movie now and um, he talked about even the original Yahweh is literally just the inhale and the yeah, exhale. We can't even right. inhale and exhale without breathing the name of yeah. God. And so I've been chewing on this breath of God ever mm, since reading that book. That. So for you to even lean in again and say, listen, the, our souls were created to flourish. And some of yeah. us, we've either held our breath through the season mm. or we've, we've breathed the secondhand smoke of our own vices, as you say. Yeah. Our souls are longing to take a deep breath and yeah. to just, and we can breathe again. That's the, that's the encouragement of this book is we don't have to live perpetually mm-hmm. weary. Our souls can breathe again and breathe, yeah. breathe the air that God intends, despite what we're going through. We're not saying it's going to be a perfect world around us, but we can flourish sometimes, as you said, even in the middle of, despite what we are dealing with. Yeah. So 
such a powerful book. Dominic, I know you're going to pray over us in a minute, but how can people get the book? It's just come out and uh, connect with you, find you. Where would you like for them to go? Yeah, well, the book's available uh, anywhere, Amazon, Barnes and Noble, Christian bookstores. Um, you can go to our website as well. Our website is pursuingfaith.org. And there's a section there on, on our books. Um, and then people can connect with me online. Um, I tend to be a little more active on Instagram. Yeah. Uh, and my handle is just at Dominic Doan. And I'll put all that in my show notes to guys for you. Your longing has a name is the name of the book. So good. You will be so blessed by it. It's a book to sit with and we're about to head into the summer. So just sit with a chapter, underline it, pray about it. What is God going to speak to you? And I'm telling you, by the end of the time you have read this book, your soul will feel like it is coming back to life. And uh, Dominic, it's such a gift. This book is a gift. I'm so grateful for it. I always love to ask my guests this last question. And I'm always curious. It might be Peter. It might be a given because I know you just <laughs> wrote about him. He's fresh in your heart. But other than yeah. Jesus, what person in the Bible has most inspired you to make life matter like we talk about here on the podcast? Yeah. You're right. It has to be Peter. Yeah, right now I understand because, that. Sure. Yeah, Peter, Peter became the the template really for this book um mm. his, his story is one of catastrophic soul fatigue yeah. and led him to a very very dark lonely place but his story is also one of restoration yeah. and by the time he was an old man he was languishing in in some prison cell somewhere there was a psychotic leader nero who mm. was on the throne at that time and yeah. who hated him but there is an old man having learned the secret of how our souls can flourish in difficult times, he takes pen to scroll and he writes these beautiful verses saying, add to your faith, these mm. things. And these seven gifts, I like to call them gifts because yeah. these aren't like legalistic religious obligations that we have to strive to attain. No, these are gifts that God gives us for our soul to flourish. Mm. And as we live them out and practice them, and invite God's spirit to do his work in us, uh, we can discover the same secret that Peter discovered. So I love his story. And plus he's, he's so raw and gritty and yeah. earthy and messy. But man, I can relate to all of that. And like you mentioned so eloquently earlier, God used those parts of his life. Yeah. The, the brash part of him, the part that was sinking when he should have been walking or sleeping when he should have been praying or you know, yeah. <laughs> just so many mistakes. And yet God used all that yeah. in, in beautiful ways uh, yeah. to bring the gospel and healing to others. I love it. I love it. He's a powerful example to us. And I want to actually close with the verses we've been talking about from second Peter yeah. chapter one, verses three through eight. And uh, it says his power, his divine power has given us, there's the gifts, everything we need for godly life through our knowledge of him who has yeah. called us by his own glory and goodness mm -hmm. through these he has given us his very great and precious promises so that through him through them you may participate in the divine nature having escaped the corruption there's those corrupted desires we talked about earlier yeah. in the world caused by evil desires and here's the verse we've been leaning into for this very reason because of that guys make every effort to add to your faith goodness and to goodness, knowledge, and to knowledge, self-control, to self-control, perseverance, and to perseverance, godliness, and to godliness, mutual affection, and to mutual affection, love. For if you possess these qualities in increasing measure, they will keep you from being ineffective and unproductive in your knowledge of our mm -hmm. Lord Jesus Christ. Truth that matters for us. Guys, we're not going to make our lives matter for the kingdom if our soul is sick, if our soul is weary, yeah. if our soul is languishing. So God wants us to bring everything we have, bring it to the table, bring it into the light, be, become self-aware of it, sit with it, and then allow him to redeem it so that he can use every single part of our story for kingdom purpose. And uh, that's when we make our lives matter. So it was important for me yeah. to bring this conversation today. Thank you, Dominic. Thank you for this book. Thank, Thank you for you. your voice yeah. and our generation. So needed. So <laughs> it's needed. an honor to see you and chat with you. I love the conversation. Thank you so much. Well, I'd love for you to pray over our listeners. I know we've yeah. probably unearthed a few things today and uh, just pray over them, especially as they maybe yeah. dive into reading this book now. Mm-hmm. 
Father, I pray for every single person right now who is listening to this podcast. Lord, we talked about breathing in your presence. Even now, Lord, we exhale failure and we breathe in grace. I pray, Father, for any who are in a place of fatigue, who their souls are languishing. There's a pain inwardly. They're struggling. It feels like their souls are gasping for air. Lord, I pray even now, just in a supernatural healing way, that you would breathe your spirit and your life into them. Lord, may our souls flourish as you intended. So I pray this for every single person listening. May this be a a new season, a season like Psalm 1, where the roots of their heart go deep into you, where a season of fruitfulness, a season of growth, a season of your presence. And we know, Lord, that that kind of flourishing that is so deeper than any shallow example of flourishing the world gives us, that flourishing, the spirit-led flourishing, is one that can prosper even in hard times. So, Lord, may this, this audience, may they understand and receive grace even now through the power of your spirit, the healing of your spirit, And Lord, may they flourish. As as John prayed, beloved, I pray that your souls would flourish. We just ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.